Welcome to the Wealth Stream Podcast. The team at Hightower Great Lakes share their insights and passions for empowering their clients to live their best life. In this energetic podcast, we will take you on a journey to help you navigate your financial future, overcome life's challenges to reach your financial goals, and find the financial clarity you've been searching for. Let's explore the downstream impact of your wealth and what it means to you, your family, and your community to live greater. Hello and welcome to The Wealth Stream with Tim Scannell from Hightower Great Lakes. Tim, how are you? I'm good, Eric. It's 2022 and this is our first podcast of, uh, of this year, so I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this, it's good to be back with you. Did you have a good break? I did. You know, actually, we really get very busy towards the end of the year, so uh, our break is just right after New Year's Day, so <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> Everyone, we need to do all kinds of planning yeah. right before 1231 to make sure that... Um, you know, we're minimizing taxes for people. So we always get pretty crazy then, but um, I've taken a, taken a break since then. So yes, thank you. Nice. All right. So we're starting this new year off. What are we talking about? Um, today, I want to talk about three things to consider when you hit your freedom point. And what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit in, um, in the beginning, just about how we define or what we think of as freedom point, and mm-hmm. then get into maybe three things people should consider when they hit theirs, because everyone's got a freedom point. Yeah, and I, I don't think I've ever heard the terminology freedom point, so I'm very interested. What what exactly does that mean? Um, so the freedom point, first of all, I'll just talk about like why I think it's important. Sure. Um, you know, we've talked in general about our wealth management process, and this is one of the topics or strategies, concepts we talk to clients about all the time that really affects everything. So it, it impacts investment planning because if all of a sudden you're at a point where you've been accumulating and saving and accumulating and you're in growth mode and boom, you've kind of got enough that that point where you are, you know, you're, you're free. Um, if you don't know you're there or if you do know you're there, I should, that's usually when we start changing strategies. Maybe we moderate, you know, go into conservation mode, et cetera. So it's important that everyone knows where they're at in terms of achieving it because we typically do want to change the investment process as a result. Um, and it also, affects you know some of the advanced planning things we do like wealth transfer you know this is oftentimes where clients start thinking about okay i've accumulated what i need um now let's start thinking um you know long term is you know family and wealth transfer what kind of strategies should we use to start possibly gifting or at the very minimum you know thinking about minimizing estate taxes when the mm-hmm. wealth is eventually uh, transferred um, it also infects, affects uh, what we call wealth protection because oftentimes uh, you're in growth mode and then when you hit this point where you're financially independent, um, you want to start protecting some of that so that at the very least if there are situations where the economy you know, falls back or there's a recession or things like that, at the very least you're protecting you know, this freedom point um, accumulation that you've accomplished. Um, and it also this is also where we start to see people talk about charitable giving. You know, I have a number of clients who get to this point, they're considering selling the business, they're considering exiting, and now they're thinking, you know, how do I give back or how do I, um, you know, think about or support some of the charities that maybe I've favored, but I haven't really had time to think about. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, it gets into also what we call relationship management, because oftentimes when you're, when I work with business owners, is there an accumulation phase or focusing in the business all the time, they oftentimes don't step back and, you know, look at the business, look at their balance sheet, make, you know, look at um, where they're at in terms of what they need and what they have. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times this is where we really want to get all the other advisors involved. We want to get their CPAs or attorneys, their, maybe their trust officers, if that's applicable. Um, And then we also want to reevaluate and make sure that they have the right team in place of advisors, of advocates for them to take them into the next generation. So, I just wanted to kind of briefly go through why I think it's important, you know, why people should really have their radar out for their individual freedom points. Um, Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd kind of go through that and maybe then talk about what it is and and how to address it. So what do you think, Eric? Yeah, I I mean, that's brilliant because, again, if you don't have all those pieces in place, it doesn't matter what the definition of freedom point is if you can't figure out how to get there um, and, exactly. and have the foundation built. So, no, I, I, I'm glad that you went through that. So now <laughs> I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> okay, sorry. So define just, freedom yeah, point. Draw it what, out of me here. Yeah what, yeah. what does that mean? What, what truly is a freedom point? 
So one of the things we will ask clients um, when we first meet them, but also like when we're doing our plan updates is, you know, what is the after-tax monthly cash flow that you need to maintain your current standard of living? And because mm-hmm. people will sometimes come into the meeting or ask me, how much do I need to retire? And I really can't tell because I have clients who spend 4000 a month after tax cash flow and I have clients who spend 50000 a month after tax cash flow. So it's all relative. And so when I talk about Freedom Point, that's why I say it's very, very individualized, very customized for mm-hmm. any, any client, any individual I work with. Because I'm working with a client right now who has got a 45-year career in the hospitality industry is is done amazing um you know no debt accumulated a sizable retirement accounts accumulated sizable investment accounts and just doesn't spend any money you know mm-hmm. so in his, in their case we're looking at you know 4 to 5000 a month which seems like a lot but in retirement with healthcare and things like that and the desire to travel isn't and again I'm I'm also working with another client right now who's forecasting a an exit in about 3 years and that's more like about twenty five, twenty six thousand a month. So their freedom points are very different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's again, this reflects everything that you do with your clients. Everything that we've talked about on this podcast leads one to the assumption that it is all personalized, right? And that's why you have deep relationships with your clients because you need to know what's going on. You need to know what their desires are, but also what their pain points are and what their you know, what the, the different things that are happening in their life positively and negatively, because all of that affects that, that financial freedom or that freedom point that you're talking about. Um, and you know, moving forward now I would fall in the former category, you know, more of that four to 5,000 a month. I don't mm. know if I could spend 50 grand a month, um, but I'd sure like to try Tim. If exactly. You... <laughs> I challenge you, sir. No, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You've thrown down the gauntlet. Um, oh, that's right. it's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously when you're, when you're disseminating this, when you're talking to your clients about this, um, they, there's a lot to take into consideration and, and I'm assuming it's, it's part of that conversation that you normally have ongoing. Yeah. So oftentimes uh, people really don't know what that, what that number is. Mm-hmm. And it's understandable, especially if like you, Eric, you're, you're a business owner, you, you do a lot of consulting, um, you know, cash comes in, cash goes out. Uh, people often don't look at really what the value of the business, what their balance sheet looks like. But if you're at four to 5,000 a month, then we can back into that. Maybe it's, you know, 1 million, $2 million, or let's say, just as an example of that, that would give you your freedom point, meaning that if you had that, based on your monthly after-tax cash flow, looking at Social Security, looking at pensions, retirement accounts, things like that, that you should, you know, and we forecast out to age 100, we assume inflation rates, um, which are going up, um, and and we want to make sure that your lifetime cash flow forecast is on track for success, and that that gives you the freedom point. And it's almost like when, to give you an example, when I you know, just started business. Uh, I was 26, I think 1988, you know, and I look back and I had a home, uh, very little equity, you know, mortgage, Mm -hmm. um, accumulating cash in the bank, um, having kids, you know, starting to save for college, you know, and then you fast forward to let's say age 50, you know, 25, four years later, now I've got maybe more home equity. I've got a retirement plan that I'm accumulating. I'm, you know, paying out education costs or maybe, I'm in the throes of it. In my case, I was because I have five kids. Um, so I'm very far from the, that freedom point because mm-hmm. I still have obligations going out the door. But, you know, as I look at my business, it's growing, you know, so maybe the business, if I had done valuations back then on my own practice and I really didn't, it, maybe I'm, it's worth $500 a million, but it doesn't matter because I'm not looking to sell it. But then you fast forward to age 60, let's say, and now maybe you have less or no debt. You know, maybe you're, your education costs are paid for. You know, we've talked in the past about, you know, we have a special needs trust for one of my kids. So there's obligations there you have to factor in. Mm-hmm. But maybe the retirement plan is starting to accumulate. You're able to max it out. But all of a sudden, if you do a valuation, and we have done this with our practice, we do this every year, all of a sudden the value is much higher than I thought. And then the value is a much larger percentage of my balance sheet. So mm-hmm. as I'm looking for my personal freedom point, I'm also trying now all the time to compare that to 
you know, what do I need versus what do I have? And what do I have to a great extent is tied up in the business. So it becomes really important, you know, to kind of look at that. Yeah. So what do you, what do you do in that point? I mean, it's a beautiful thing that the business, you know, has grown and, and has increased in value that much. But if you have most of your assets, I guess, uh, or most of the value of your retirement or, or toward that freedom point in that business, that's not always a good thing either. Exactly. And, you know, we're, we teach all our clients and clients read about it all the time that, you know, investing is the key to investing is diversify. Mm -hmm. And we diversify a lot with 401ks, investment plans, et cetera. But I'm guilty of this myself. And when, as a business owner, when I look at other business owners, we fail to achieve, you know, diversification because our business grows and it becomes a bigger part of the balance sheet. So step one really is coming up with that, what is my monthly after-tax cash flow, Mm -hmm. backing into your freedom point. And then also step two is, you know, periodically doing a valuation of your business, identifying what it's worth. And then if it's done properly when you do the valuation and you work with people who also help you focus on what we call value drivers, it allows you then to identify two, three, four things that you can focus on between now and when you do retire to make sure that if you're not at the freedom point where you have what you need, that you will be, you know, when you're ready to do that. So it's a two-step process of evaluating what you have, what you need, and then secondly, create this kind of uh, initial process to kind of go through and make sure you, you can follow it along. Got it. So what happens if somebody finds themselves in that particular situation? I mean, as far as, is, is there something you can do when your your business is worth a whole lot more and it can contribute to your freedom point, but not in the current state it's in? I mean, you don't want to just say, well, let's just go ahead and sell everything. How, how, do, you, how do you do that? So I, I think one of the things that the COVID pandemic has you know, taught us and, you know, Rick, Eric, we were just talking about this before we started, but there's really nothing for sure. And I've watched a lot of business mm-hmm. owners really pivot, um, really, you know, transition to mobile, to, you know, offsite, et cetera. And, and so I think it, it's important that you look at the options. And so let's say, for example, like you just said, Eric, I've done the analysis where I know what I need. I know what after tax cash flow I want. I know what that means in terms of assets. And as a result, I know that I also need to pull some of that out of the business because maybe out in my retirement accounts, et cetera, that, that alone does not give me the freedom. So there's three options, three things you can do, I think, and what I've seen uh, people do successfully in order to help. And it get back, gets back to that diversification that we talked about. And number one would be you can sell a minority stake in your business. And when I talk to business owners, uh, about this, oftentimes they think, well, you know, I don't want a partner. Am I getting myself into trouble if I'm just selling a portion? Why would anyone want 25%, let's say, of my business? And what happens out there right now, especially in the marketplace, is there's a lot of financial investors. Maybe they sold their own business. Maybe they've sold real estate. Maybe for whatever reason, they're looking to diversify and invest beyond just um, buying individual stocks mm-hmm. and bonds on the mm-hmm. marketplace. So, you know, I have an example of a client who did this recently as a result of COVID in the restaurant business. And what they did was they sold um, a, about a third, roughly, of their ownership uh, to, an, to an investor. So this investor had sold a business. This investor was looking to get his hands back into kind of, you know, being involved in entrepreneurship and in business. There was a lot of conversation amongst the attorneys and the accountants and, you know, you know, how involved or not involved or, you know, what are the, the roles and responsibilities. But it was a case where it was a really a win-win for both because the, the seller of the owner of the one-third interest, they were able to pull some money off the table. They were mm-hmm. able to diversify their, diversify their balance sheet to give them more financial security for their family. Uh, we were able to do it in a very tax-advantaged way. And at the same time, the investor was able to really participate in an investment that will likely give a better return um, or can, I should say, I don't want the regulators mad at me, but can possibly give a mm-hmm. better return than, um, you know, just investing somewhere else. So that's one thing they could do. Yeah. I mean that, okay. So that's, and again, because it's one third and you're the majority owner still, obviously, um, and that's protected. It's, they're more like a silent partner, right? I would assume. Yeah. In that case as a minority that you typically want, and oftentimes you're able to get, you know, a financial investor who will be a minority partner. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully they're offering some expertise. Maybe they have, 
information about the industry technology that they can add. But in general, they're going to be passive investors. Yes. Yeah. And then what, what do you suggest the owner does with that that money, that that cash flow? And, and again, I'm, I'm assuming this is all about personal choice, you know, and, and depending on the age, maybe there's different types of investments or you, you want to be more aggressive or less aggressive or whatever. But what in in that scenario would happen? Well, so in our in a perfect world, what I would love to see for any individual that goes into retirement is they have, you know, a, a good size retirement account that's going to provide cash flow. They have um, maybe possibly an investment portfolio or money in the bank that gives them a- access to money that isn't penalized or taxed mm-hmm. if they need it. And then the third one is no debt. So as people are pulling, sell, like if you're selling a minority stake and you're pulling money out, first and foremost, you want to do a lot of tax planning in advance to make mm. sure that when it does come out, you're paying the least amount of taxes. But then when you do get the after-tax cash flow, we'll typically work with that individual to say, all right, what's the pyramid of priorities? Is it do you have debt we want to pay down? You know, do we want to fund a retirement plan more heavily? Do we want to accumulate in the cash? So we'll look at the three legs of the stool and see where the weakest leg is, and then we'll help that client specifically, you know, build a stronger stool, I guess. Got it. Yeah, that makes makes sense. And then the second option would be if you're really looking, maybe you're closer to retirement, um, you might think of selling a majority stake in the business. So mm. a majority stake is where, you know, it could be a number of things. Could be a family office is looking to come in and invest in your industry. Um, a lot of industries have what we call roll-up firms. So um, I have a client who's in the uh, technology business, and there's a number of companies out there that just want to acquire technology businesses, combine them, make them more efficient, eventually you know, sell them off as a larger group. I've had clients in uh, dental practices who have done the same thing. So, the, so there's a lot of people out there, a lot of companies that are looking to basically take a a more serious investment in your business. So like we have a partnership, for example, with Hightower. Hightower is our registered investment advisory firm. They help us with our platform. They help us, you know, with all the technology we need. But they're also open and interested in investing in firms like ours, Uh, not necessarily to operate them because they're not operators, but morally because um, it's it's kind of the concept is vertical vertical integration where they're looking to maybe solidify the relationship and they see us as a great operator, a good business, a growing business, doing um, you know really good work for clients. So they're looking to make an investment. And when they make those types of investments, oftentimes they'll want to take more than you know at least a fifty one percent or some majority ownership interest in that. So that's something that you that clients I've seen consider where other competitors or other vendors who are maybe up channel or down channel where they're looking to get into their side of the business maybe, where they come in and they really provide a lot of liquidity, um, take a majority stake, and then and likely are looking for the owner to work there for a while, but eventually sell the remaining piece, maybe in, to internal people or et cetera. But that is a strategy which a lot of people will take as they're closer to retirement or looking or the closer to being exiting. Yeah. Now I'm going to date myself and you okay. <laughs> in this next thing, but are there uh, pretty good uh, protections for an owner? If they're going to sell a majority stake, I liken back to, um, you know, pretty woman, the movie. <laughs> you remember yeah. that? Yeah. Where yes. I think Richard Gear or Greer or whatever his name is, his job was to go in and buy these companies and then tear them all apart and sell them off piece by piece, blah, blah, blah. I don't think any owner likes the idea of that. Um, but if they're selling a majority stake, is there is there some protections in place where the you know the, the he can say hey look or she can say I don't want my company torn apart. I mean you mentioned maybe uh, I guess it was a roll up company or you know where maybe they fold that company into another company. I, I kind of get that, but are the protections that the the owner can kind of put in place because they we, we've talked before that you know businesses are like our babies, right? I mean we're we're growing them and we you know help to conceive them and so on and so forth, and it's just. It, it can be a very emotional tie to it. Yeah, you know, it, it depends. And this this is a very dangerous option because, the, yes, there's all kinds of terrible stories of somebody selling a majority stake and really the buyer's just running the company into the ground. Yeah. The, you need to do so much due diligence. And we've, we've covered on a number of podcasts where we've interviewed some people who have sold, we've interviewed, we've talked about different uh, possible buyers. For example, 
a private equity firm, by their very nature, they're going to want to come in and they're basically, they're going to want to just make it more profitable, make it grow faster somehow. So they're probably going to let a lot of people go. They're going to change everything and they're going it, to, it's up, it's their company once they buy it mm-hmm. and their intent is likely to flip it. Not always, but that's usually the case. Whereas a family office, you know, maybe somebody who has sold their business in the past, they're looking to invest long term. Mm-hmm. Or if you have a competitor or you have a product, service, or a trademark, you might have somebody coming in and they're looking for you to stay or your key people to stay. So the answer is yes and no, mm-hmm. but I can't stress uh, enough how you really need uh, really strong, especially legal support and tax support if you're going to, when you take this option, because it can go really bad yeah. if you don't you know, plan in advance. Are there are there other options, Tim? Yeah. So the third option would be that we've seen is, and I just talked to a, a client yesterday who is in the real estate business, uh, residential real estate, and and he was just saying that in his industry right now, if you're selling your, you know, let's say you have Prudential Realty or, you know, one of the brands that are out there, Remax, if you're selling that franchise or that brand you're not going to get a check. That He said apparently that's just the nature of where that marketplace is for the business that he's in. So it's an earnout, hmm. And an earnout is, you know, they're going to say, all right, we will pay you, but we're going to pay you over, let's say, five years. So let's say they're going to pay you a million dollars. You're going to get 200000 a year for the next five years maybe, but if, in fact, uh, performance is better than some benchmark they set, you'll probably get more than the million. If, if it's less, like all of a sudden there's attrition, clients leave, brokers leave in this case, mm-hmm. then you'll probably get less. So you're, you're still taking a lot of risk. You're, you know, when I sell a business, if I'm selling the majority, in theory, you're getting cash, right? So you, you know what you have. When you're, when you're selling on an earnout, it's literally, you're earning it as you go out and um, you're still assuming a lot of the risk. So this is one that often is necessitated Oftentimes there's an earnout as part of a sale, like either a minority or a majority sale, mm-hmm. or in case of the industries like this one, that's all there is. And if you're looking to get out, you really have to plan on hanging around for, you know, three, five years. So, but that would be the third one, what they call an earnout, or there's also reverse earnouts too. Okay. So are you still the majority in that situation? Because I mean, if you are dependent on how the business done, but they have control of it, how much control do you have to make sure that the business continues to grow? You know, that's the thing. Um, it depends, but in general, what I've seen is you lose control. So Oof-ta. if you're accepting just an earnout, I think you're in a position where you're saying that based on my industry, based on the marketplace, mm-hmm. or based on the nature of my business right now, where it's at, and I, and I really need to get out as a result of maybe health or things like that, I just have to take whatever I can get. Yeah. So if you're just taking an earnout without any sort of minority stake upfront sale or you know majority stake sale upfront, it's really because the, you're either your business wasn't prepared, but you have to get out, or just the the industry is just really struggling. Yeah. Okay. Well, it so sounds like there's not, three. Uh, it's not always a great option, I guess is my point. That, but in all instances, you really need to work hard. Make sure you have the right team to yeah. to cover those risks that you've talked about, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what do we close with today, Tim? So I think the takeaway is that I, I mean, like me, I, I love my business. I love building my business. It's super rewarding. I love working with my clients. Um, what I have to do and what everyone has to do is you have to make sure you're, you always look at what do you need versus what do you have. And you don't want to miss the point where all of a sudden you're at the freedom point, but maybe you didn't realize it. And now maybe you're taking more risks than you have to. So what I would recommend the listeners do is, you know, get get a value for your business, um, you know, and get a process in place, you know, calculate that freedom point and really start working on your exit plan. And for anyone who wants to, they can certainly always reach out to me for resources and support and help. All right. And how do they do that? They can call me at Hightower Great Lakes at 219-531-4941 or send me an email at tscanell at hightoweradvisors.com. All right. Sounds great. Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. You bet. And our last thank you, of course, goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the WealthStream Podcast with Tim Scannell. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Tim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, 
Thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Hightower Great Lakes, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Stream podcast. We hope you gained some valuable insight that you can apply to your life and share with others. Please don't forget to subscribe below to be notified when new episodes become available. And don't forget to live greater. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Hightower Great Lakes. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Hightower Great Lakes is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities Securities LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors LLC. 